Uh, my name is Dana Vasali, and uh, this is uh, based on a class, a six six part class I gave during the winter in January. And I do have the six PDFs from that class. If at, if at the end of this you want to look at some of those PDFs, you're welcome to them. I can email them to you. You would have to email me and ask for them. My email is at the end of the program. My email is Dana at metanet.com. And it'll be there at the end. And I got, so I got my inspiration. It's a book called, and you saw the book, uh, Deirdre wrote it down, I recommend it, called The Eternal Frontier, Ecological History of North America. And uh, I mean, I read it first at least 10 years ago and really, really enjoyed it. And I've read it at least once again since then. And it actually starts, I think it starts only 65 million years ago with the asteroid that almost surely hit the Earth 65 million years ago and caused a mass extinction, which you've probably heard of. They call it the KT extinction. And there's a little, we'll have a slide on that. But the history of North America goes back quite a bit further than 65 million years. So, so that's one thing I wanted to say. Another thing is this is hyper abbreviated. We're covering something like uh, 65 million, uh, excuse me, 400 million years in half an hour. Ha. Huh. So we're just hitting the high points. And uh, there are many things I wouldn't have, I won't have time to explain. And there are many things I would have no way of explaining. <laughs> It's just, uh, but it's, you know, it's a, rel it's a relatively reasonably accurate story that the brilliance of the human mind has uncovered. So this first slide is a picture of North America 75 million years ago. And there was an ocean in the middle of North America called the uh, Western Interior Seaway or the Bear Paw Sea for 60 million years. Who knew? How strange is that? The whole story is just continually odd. Uh, so, the, so at that time, North America was split into two main parts, east and west, and there was no communication on among the life forms because there was 500 miles of ocean in between. Uh, and then, so that, but that ocean prior to 300 million years ago, that ocean wasn't there. And after 150 million years ago, it disappeared. And that is the nature of the history of the Earth. Everything comes and goes. And that, I think, is the next slide. I actually have this. I'm going to admit this so I get that picture out of it. I just love this quote. It's from 2,000 years ago. Time is a river of passing events and strong as its current. No sooner is a thing brought into sight than it's swept by, and nothing takes its place. That too will be swept along. I mean, that sounds sounds a little unnerving at first, but but then the actual nature of the planet, according to the scientific story, reflects that reality. And uh, I think I think actually I think it may it might improve our lives to embrace that to understand that we're part of a major drama. And it's our good fortune to be able to be here and participate in it. Oh, we have some kind of glitch here. Oh. So second, another quote, this is by David Alt, who's a geologist, and he wrote a book that you may have seen called Roadside Geology of Washington. Uh, and then this book called Northwest Exposures. He said, we, when we were new to, geolo to geology, we thought the rocks were solid and enduring. Now they seem like fog. It's a perspective that geologists get. I'm not a geologist, but I love to dip into geology and get that sense of how impermanent everything are in it. So it struck me, I'm here on the East County Road and up above me, is, there's Bucky Hill and the Eagle Rocks. Eagle Rocks is part of the Pipestone Formation. Pipestone formation is 60 million years old. It's all sedimentary rock laid down by water. Some of those rocks are the size of Volkswagens. And they were laid down 
by some drama that I've never had explained to me 60 million years ago. And they turned into rock and they were uplifted and bared by the ice. And now they stand up there, you know, about 500 foot tall cliff. And in 30 million years, they'll be a plane. They'll be gone. <laughs> like fog. And this quote, I think by Henry David Thoreau, it doesn't matter who said it. It's shortened to the point. I actually replaced a longer one. Spirituality is the ability to get our minds off of ourselves. We're so wrapped up in ourselves. I mean, if you watch, if we watch the way our minds work, it's just so much about us. And and there's a miraculous story unfolding all around us all the time, and we barely have time for it. Because we're busy thinking. So this is uh, a sort of a map of the early earth and the continents on the early earth. And the point here is there wasn't much in the way of continental rock. Continents, like life, continents have evolved over time. Now, how is it possible? I'm not sure how well I will do explaining that, especially in a related way. But look at North America. <clears throat> Most of the original, so they call these early rocks when the earth first cooled. There was continental rock they called cratons. And there are that many, the blue, the blue splotches, the cratons. But there wasn't much to North America. There wasn't much to Africa. So somehow the rest has evolved over time. Seems very mysterious, but it is the case. Uh, so I'm having a little trouble with my clicker for unknown reasons. But when I click on the page, it advances. So here, the, here's a graph on the left of the growth of continents over time. And so the scale at the bottom is billions of years starting. The zero is four billion years ago. So we're moving forward in time. One, two, three, four three. billion years now. This is showing now the growth of continents. The continents have evolved over time. The lower graph shows some scientists' interpretation, and that, that graph goes in the other direction from four billion years ago and right to current time. And the big spikes in the pink color are spikes in the growth of continental rock. There's some evidence that there were spikes, and that shows in the graph on the left as well. For some reason, there were growth spurts of continents, and even just that in itself, how strange is that? But I think of lot of the evolving rocks evolving. Yes, sir. Another note in this story is that there seems to be some connection to the growth of continents and oxygen in the atmosphere. There was all the oxygen in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is 21% oxygen. Oxygen is one of the most reactive elements on the periodic table. It loves to react with other elements and then it's no longer oxygen. And then it's water or it's uh, anything, you know, uh, that's reacted with iron, we call it rust. It reacts with many, many other elements. But the atmosphere is 21% oxygen. How is that possible? Life pumps the oxygen into the atmosphere. It's a product of photosynthesis. There seems to be some relationship between the growth of continents and the oxygen in the atmosphere. And so there's arguably a relationship between the, the increase in photosynthesis, that would be Cyanobacteria and plants are the photosynthesizers and the growth of continents. This is a strange story, really. It's kind of mystical in my mind, uh, but it's science. We're talking science. Um, Dana, can I just remind everybody to mute themselves because I keep hearing some talking. Please mute yourselves. Thank you. Do feel free. I wish I could see myself just so I know, but I just <laughs> heard. Uh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Hey, Dana. Yeah. We, we just want to be sure we're with you. I'm Alan in, in Bellevue. Suzanne. Peary. What a treat. Yes, yeah. it's nice, nice, to, see nice to, see to see you again. Nice to see you guys. I remember you well. Uh oh. Oh, good. <laughs> Boy, that's the first time we've ever done Zoom. Congratulations. That's why we're late. <laughs> Do you know how to mute yourself? <laughs> no. How do you mute yourself? If you if you if you have a um, 
Are you on an iPad or are you on a, what are you on? We're on an iMac. iMac. Desktop. A desktop. Okay, so go take your cursor and put it at the lower left-hand corner and you'll you'll see a little pop-up and you'll see a little mic and it says mute. Yeah, yeah. got it. Okay, yeah, just mute yourselves because then we don't hear any noise from your end. And we'll have some conversation at the end, although so far we're going mighty slow. The one other thing I want to say about this slide and the growth of continental rock is that. So whoever's phone is ringing, you're not muted. Yeah, Connie, turn oh. yourself off, please. Mute yourself. Or answer your phone. Oh. <laughs> uh, most of the life, so most of the life on the planet, there's thought to be something like 10 million species. Nobody knows. There could be 20 million species, depending on how, you know, if you're counting bacteria. Most of the life on the planet is on land. And my previous point is it looks like the, the growth of land is related to life itself. So there's an interrelationship between life, the continents, and the amount of the, the diversity of life on the planet. Now, there was no life on land. Back, that's two slides ago, I showed those cratons. Early in the history of the Earth, if there was any life, it was in the ocean. Now, most life is on land. So, it's an interesting story. I went backwards, sorry. So, it's dynamic. Everything is so dynamic. Here's a little movie for you of Pangaea breaking up. And so, we know, you've heard, all the continents were joined together about 300 million years ago, and then broke up about 175 million years ago. Not only were they joined together, but they've been joined together about five times. This was just the last time. They're constantly moving. Now, some of you know, when this was first suggested, and actually it was suggested, I think, maybe even in the 1500s, some geographer, once they got the lay of the land, they saw that South America fit into Africa so well, but nobody could understand how that could be. And then in the early 1900s, some people suggested that the continents moved. And he, you know, Alfred Wegener, he was a meteorologist. He was laughed out of the room. But now we know they do. And now we can measure them with um, sonar, uh, oh no, lasers. We now know they move. The problem for humans is your pets get separated from you as the continents drift apart. Now this is a joke, and hopefully you can see the joke, because continents move at about an inch a year. But as I said, we now are able to measure them with lasers. We can measure the movement, and that's about the speed our fingernails grow. But anyhow, keep track of your dog. Keep it on a leash. <laughs> and Deirdre, let me know if uh, anything's not working here. Will do. Okay. So, so, so we're talking about the movement of continents. How is it possible? Nobody knew about this, by the way. Nobody knew this until the 1960s. And it wasn't accepted by the U.S. Geological Society until 1970. It's amazing how much our view of the Earth has changed over time. But then now we know that what's happening is what's represented in this graphic, and that is that magma is welling up from cracks in the Earth in the middle of the ocean. There's a crack down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that's 10,000 miles long, the whole length of the Atlantic Ocean, called the Mid-Oceanic Ridge, and lava's pouring up out of it, and it's pushing the, uh, the crust that came up earlier and cooled, which is a rock called basalt, it's pushing it out of the way because uh, there's so much heat and pressure, it pushes the previously formed ocean crust, basalt, to the east and to the west. At some point, that crust, that crust is moving. At some point, that crust runs into a continent. Continents are a different kind of rock. They're actually less dense. They have more silica. Silica is a big deal in this story. Silica is SiO2. Silica is quartz. Silica is glass. All the same thing. Glass is SiO2. Quartz is SiO2. Silica is SiO2. It's just less dense than the material that makes up the ocean crust. It's less dense than the material that makes up the mantle. When the ocean crust runs into the continental crust, it sinks because it's heavier. It's so simple. I mean, this kind of this stuff is understandable. It sinks under the ocean crust, under the continental crust, but th there's not a hole down there. It doesn't go into a hole. 
there's already rocks. And so it's shoved down under the continent. It creates heat and pressure. The rock is melted and comes up as volcanoes. And so in that graphic, you see a line of volcanoes along the coast because all along the coast, this, this ocean crust is being shoved under the continent. It's uh, stunning. Now, there's a lot more to talk about there, and I'm not going to do it because everything takes too long. So this is a simpler picture of the same thing. The upper, so there's two pictures, the upper one. On the left is a continent, it's labeled continent. And the thing with the arrow on it, or the sort of turquoise, greeny, blue, thin line is ocean crust. And when it's pushed up against a continent, it sinks. They call it subduction. It sinks under the continent. Now there's two little tan things stuck on that ocean crust, and it says terrain. It's labeled terrain. In the second picture, so they're moving like on, like on an escalator or a conveyor belt with the ocean crust, but they're a different kind of rock. They're continental crust. They're made out, they're high silica rock, like the continent. When they reach the continent, they can't sink. They're too light, and they get welded onto the continent. They get welded onto the continent, and the continent gets bigger. And then that second one's gonna, get, gonna reach there, gonna reach the continent and get welded on there. And here is the, the, here is what happens over time. This is the west coast of North America, and all of those different colored patches are terrains that got glued onto the west coast of North America over time by this process of plate tectonics. I mean, it's mind blowing. So what I'm doing here is hitting these astonishing high points of the history of the earth, but more in North America. So we're just jumping from, now we jump from plate tectonics it's now thought that the earth has frozen almost solid, or at least they laughingly call it slush ball earth, at least once in history. And that would be also related to life. Life was sucking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We know that carbon dioxide is, we know that too much is not good, too little is also not good. Carbon dioxide is the blanket that keeps one of the several gases that keeps the earth warm, it keeps it well above the freezing temperatures of space. Plants are made out of carbon dioxide. They're 90% carbon dioxide. As plants grew on the, on the newly formed continents, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide levels fell so low that the earth cooled off and the earth is now thought that the earth froze. Well, why do we think that? Well, the lower picture shows these um, boulders, one boulder in particular that's that's rounded by water, looks like it's rounded by glacial ice, it's embedded in rocks in Central Africa. How could that happen? The only explanation science has been able to come up with, and it's, I'd say it's, it's accepted by degrees, maybe 75% of the geological community accepts this concept of a snowball earth. But it thought out. Why did it thaw out? It thawed out because of volcanic activity constantly pumps carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and it, went, and it warmed up the earth. So this is the Bear Paw Sea. So this is over time from the left 185 million years ago, MYA million years ago, 92 million years ago, 70 million years ago. You can see, it's just, it was interesting to me to see the beginning of the uh, Bear Paw Earth over there on the left. You know, it's a little bit like it looks today with the Salish Sea, Puget Sound. <laughs> And it flooded inland. Why it flooded inland is a geological explanation. It has to do with plate tectonics. Remember that on the west coast, the ocean crust is, is subducting. It's diving under the continental crust. It's pushing the continental crust up. There's not a lot of room down there. It pushes the continental crust up. That warps the interior of the continent. It warps it downward. That's the explanation if you look at this online. And so the actual center of the, of the continent sank a bit. It was a shallow sea, but it was full of life. There are fossils of fish 20 feet long, sharks, uh, pterosaurs, uh, flying dinosaurs in Kansas. And that's because Kansas was an ocean 150 million years ago. And here's the ice. Here's the mud turned into sedimentary rock in Utah 
you know, places that we would go if we could. Uh, I would love to go to uh, all, all those great national parks, but they're all, <laughs> this is what they're made out of. They're made out of inland sea. And then the cliff dwellings at the four corners in the bottom is the overlying sedimentary layer of sandstone. It was the beach. It was the coastal area of the inland sea. That's where sand is laid down. And so the whole history of the earth is just laid out in the geology around us. How come they're in the waiting room? Admit. Okay. So this is, uh, this is the most complicated picture. I think I debated whether to put it in just because there's a lot of information there. So on the upper right, it says Pan, Pangaea. Pangaea, that's the one continent that formed. It formed 300 million years ago. It broke up about 200 million years ago. We like round numbers. So Rodinia was another continent. Columbia was another, uh, not a continent, but uh, all the continents joined together into one mass. They come together, they go apart. They come together, they go apart. And meanwhile, the column shows life changing over time. At the bottom, there's no life. At four th four, the 4,000 number, which is 4 billion years ago, it says earliest life. There was no life on Earth for the first half billion years. Shockingly, life appeared early, soon after the Earth cooled enough for living organisms to exist, life appeared. But it was bacteria, it says single-celled life. The big story on Earth really is photosynthesis. See that big block there, it says photosynthesis, because where does food come from, from anim for animals? It all comes from photosynthesis. Photosynthesis are plants and bacteria, cyanobacteria, taking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turning it into sugar. It's a magic trick. And that's where all the food for animals comes from. Without plants, there would be no animals. Well, there was no photosynthesis. Life had to invent it. Oh, and then I just circled, that was uh, cryogeny, and that's the snowball earth. Uh, but at the very top, there's that little rectangle at the very top. That's land plants. I mean, excuse me, land, life on land which is to say for most of the history of the earth, there was no life on land. Life had to learn how to live on land. Here's a picture of the United States of North America 470 million years ago, or the BCM period. I, for a joke, I put you are here because you can see the states there. I see Montana, here, I got a cursor. Can you see that cursor? There's Montana, that's probably Wyoming. Well, there's no Washington because those terrains haven't been shoved onto the continent yet. So we would be here. This is where Washington would be. Uh, this is about the time life started to colonize land. And the first life was a form of algae that, that was able to adapt to a, an existence not immersed in water and slowly evolved into plants. And if you look at the plant kingdom now, if you were to Google the plant kingdom, you would find out that green algae is now included in the plant kingdom. It didn't used to be, now it is. And I find it interesting, this is not a direct evolutionary line, but we have this plant at the top picture, there's stonewort, it's an algae. Uh, it's very common in the Methow. It's in Perigen Lake and it's in Buck Lake and it's in Patterson Lake. It's very common. If you drop like an anchor down, if you pull the anchor up, this stuff's all stuck all over the anchor, tangled all over the rope. Look how much it looks like horsetails, which are a land plant. Now, Stone, I'm not saying stonewort evolved into horsetails, it's just the similarity. You can see the potential for algae to evolve into plants, and that's what happened. As I said, you can't have animals on land until you have plants. There would be nothing to eat. But over time, animals moved onto land because uh, we're not going very fast. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say amphibians. Life moved onto land, but it moved onto land slowly. So amphibians, the word amphibian means two lives. They live their life in water and they live their life on land. In fact, the larvae have gills and they get their oxygen out of the water and the adults have lungs and they get their oxygen out of the air. I mean, you want a connection between <laughs> the water, living in the water and living in the land. The amphibians are the connection. So, uh, 
All Life is Related. This is a cartoon, although there is a good book called Your Inner Fish. This is Chucky. That's uh, Charles Darwin. And it's just being encouraged to, it's just a joke, but it's also <laughs> illustrating the fact all life is related. All life is related. All life evolved from earlier life. These are your brothers and sisters. So amphibians cannot stay on land because they have to go back to the water to lay eggs. So this invention of a hard shell, they call it an amniotic egg that reptiles invented. It's an evolutionary step from, from amphibians to an egg is like, it struck me as sort of funny, it's like Gore-Tex. It retains water, Gore-Tex hopefully keeps water out, but it breathes, it breathes. So the egg needs oxygen. Egg can move through the shell, but water can't get out. So reptiles basically carry the ocean with them. Our bodies are 65% water. We're walking little bags of seawater. That's how life learned to live on land. Once reptiles appeared, they just, there were there were mammals, but they were small. They were like shrews. Life took off. I was interested. I should have put Tyrannosaurus rex in, but there was this. This was a major dinosaur in North America. Numerous fossils from 150 million years ago. But we did have Tyrannosaurus rex, which was 10 times larger than this. But they all went extinct suddenly 65 million years ago, and it's and there. It, Nobody could understand why, but the dinosaurs just disappear in the fossil record all over the planet at a very particular time, at about 65 million years ago. Evidence has been found for an asteroid strike. The asteroid was like six miles in diameter. It was traveling 50,000 miles per hour and it hit the Yucatan Peninsula. There's a big crater in uh, the Gulf of Mexico that has been found that this is accepted by, I would say, about 90% of the scientific, the geology community. Not everybody accepts it, but something killed them. Now, that, that, that would have put so much dust up into the atmosphere that it would have prevented photosynthesis. There would have been a collapse of the ecosystem. And what it looks like is all large animals died and small animals lived. And, that's, and so these are mass extinctions over time. And we were just talking about the last one over on the right, late Cretaceous. There's an asteroid in the picture about to hit uh, that graph, but there are four other ones. And the worst one is in the middle called the Permian extinction. And it's thought 90% of all life on the planet went extinct. So some of this is quite troubling. The other side of the picture is the green color is the increase in the diversity of life over time. And we at the current time is over on the right. There's far more life on the planet now than there has ever been. So in spite of the tremendous adversity to life on the planet, life has increased over time. More drama. So I was looking into this. I didn't never heard of this thing, La Garita. It's one of the largest volcanic explosions in the history of the earth. 28 million years ago, it's in Colorado. It blew, well, we, I think we can get to it in the next slide. It blew an incredible amount of volcanic debris into the atmosphere. So here, so that yellow box is a Yellowstone, one of the big Yellowstone explosions. We know now, I mean, you probably know Yellowstone. It's a volcano. It's a huge volcano. Yellowstone, the big explosion at, in, at Yellowstone blew 2,500 cubic, oh, yeah, cubic kilometers of volcanic debris into the atmosphere, 25,000, 2,500 cubic kilometers. There, that was two million years ago. The upper box, the pink one, Toba, Toba went off 75,000 years ago, 2,800 cubic kilometers of volcanic debris. I'm gonna pull up, oh, Mount St. Helens, one cubic kilometer. <laughs> La Garita, over now, uh, bottom left, 5,000 cubic kilometers of volcanic debris from blowing out of this volcano 28 million years ago it said that the volcanic ash was 300 feet deep in, in Colorado. So this is a drama. This is just the drama of the earth. This is a Yellowstone, Yellowstone uh, explosion, volcanic eruptions, and ash fall. So the green one is half a million years ago. The blue one is one million years ago. The yellow one is the big one two million years ago. That was, I'm gonna go back, 24. 500 cubic kilometers. It covered half of the United States. 
two million years ago. It goes off, the Yellowstone volcano goes off about every 600,000 years, and it's been about 600,000 and one year now since it went off. So it's expected to go off again. Then what? The Columbia basalts. <laughs> so this is 15 million years ago. The, the, this, is, well, this is basalt, like the, like the oceanic crust, just pouring out of the earth on the continental rock. And there are cracks there, these lines. The earth just cracked open, multiple cracks. They, they show sort of uh, center right underneath the word snake. That's a snake river. You can see these lines. The earth just cracked over and basalt poured out for five million years. And it, basalt is more fluid than some other kinds of volcanic rock. Mount St. Helens was rhyolite. Rhyolite won't flow. So Mount St. Helens blew up. Basalt flows and it flew all the way to the ocean. It went down the Columbia River. All the, it didn't show up going to the ocean, but it did go to the ocean. And we're just talking drama here. We're just talking, and here it is. This is the Columbia River basalt, laid bare in part by, sorry, I thought I could hit it, but it's not there, by the Missoula floods. So these are layers of uh, progressive over 5 million years. Basalt cooled probably 100,000 years, another basalt layer, another 100,000 years. <laughs> Tough place to live. These are eruptions of volcanoes um, on, along the Pacific Northwest coast. It's you know, a pretty interesting graphic because you can see, so it goes back 4,000 years in the bottom left. There's a little time scale, 4,000 years, 2,000 years to the present. So you can see what the volcanoes are. You can see there's a line of volcanoes and you can see which ones are the most active. Well, which one's most active? Well, you can see it. You can't tell me because you're muted. Mount St. Helens goes off all the time. Just repeatedly over 4,000 years, Rainier is fairly active. Rainier is considered the most dangerous volcano in the world because it's so close to urban areas. This is just the nature of life. I mean, I will say. Rainier was considered the most dangerous. Is considered what? The Rainier is considered very dangerous. One of the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous volcanoes on the planet. It's it's so active and it's near urban areas. So let's see, I don't, I forget. Why is there this line of volcanoes? The reason is what we looked at before because all along the Pacific coast, there's ocean crust being jammed under the continental crust and there's no room. So it heats up the rock and it creates a line of volcanoes. It's called the ring of fire and it goes all the way around the Pacific. So let's see, what have we had? We've had, well, we've had a lot of fire. We've had asteroid strikes, we've had extinctions. Also, and we did have snowball earth with ice. The Methow had a mile of ice in it just, just 16,000 years ago, recently. A mile of ice, it covered everything. There was more ice in North America 16,000 years ago than there is in Antarctica today. I find that to be mind blowing. That's recently, 16,000 years ago is nothing. That was one of at least 20 glacial advances during the Pleistocene. What happened after the ice? Well, let's have a flood. As the ice was melting, you know the story of the Missoula floods, they're called the Brecht floods, they're called the Spokane floods. The largest, the largest floods that have ever occurred on the planet, except there was a similar flood in central Russia called the Altai floods that uh, Alan Gillespie, who lives here, geologist at UW, worked on the Altai floods, so he could tell us about them. They were slightly larger, people don't know for sure, they're both huge. The largest, so this was, as you, you know the story a little bit, but an ice dam in Montana blocked the outflow of water from the melting glaciers as the glaciers melted 15,000 years ago, the end of the ice age, a huge ice built up where Missoula is to, excuse me, a huge lake. The ice dam was floated out of the way. The big lake got so deep, the ice dam floated, the water flowed out. It's now thought this happened about 40 times, repeatedly, 15,000, 14,000 years ago. And the biggest floods had more water in them than flows in all the rivers of the world today. And 15,000 years ago, there probably were homo sapiens in North America, which we're only gonna touch briefly on. We're talking about drama and change. This is change in sea level over time. The upper picture is a million years. So that time scale at the top uh, is um, 
hundreds of thousands of years. The number 800 is 800,000 years ago. Mostly what you can see is change, but the lower picture shows the scale. On the very far bottom left, there's meters. And it shows that the sea levels were 125, 150 meters lower 16,000 years ago because all the water was tied up in ice than they are today. Sea levels have also been 100 feet higher than they are today. And not only did they change that once, so the larger graph shows change over time. The ice is advancing and retreating, the, the glaciers are blowing up and down, the uh, volcanoes are blowing off. And it's a very dynamic place. These are all mammals that lived in North America. They were all ex existed in North America 15,000 years ago, and they're all extinct today. There were 75 species of large mammals. Uh, large, I think the definition is over 100 kilograms. That's over 200 pounds. Uh, 75 species of large mammals over 200 pounds went extinct about 12,000 years ago. It's, it's an amazing phenomenon. So here's a great quote, Paul Martin, a famous uh, paleontologist from uh, University of Arizona. We think this is the land of the, the, the deer and the buffalo, where the deer and the buffalo roam. It's, it's, this is the land of elephants, camels, horses, and ground sloths. That's what lived here for the last two million years. It's only been the land of the deer for the last, you know, 10,000 years. Or Charles Darwin, somehow, the brilliance of Tar Charles Darwin, he got onto this. He said, after uh, Voyage of the Beagle, it's impossible to reflect on the chain state of the American continent without the deepest astonishment. It must have swarmed with monsters. Now it's a land of pygmies. And I can't help but dwell on elephants. There were six species of elephants in North America. <laughs> I'm sure there were elephants in the Methow. Elephant, these fossils, mammoth and mastodon fossils have been found. Well, mammoth fossils have been found all over Washington. Mastodon here and there. So we don't have much time. We're just trying to astonish ourselves. Uh, this uh, Manus Mastodon site, this was found in 1977 or 78. Uh, this guy, uh, Manus, that's his last name, Emmanuel Manus, he was digging a well, of, excuse me, a pond with a backhoe and he pulled up these tusks. And they found the almost complete skeleton of a mastodon. And actually, it took years, but Sometime later, they found this spear point embedded in the vertebrae of this mastodon and realized that Homo sapiens had killed it. And it's dated at 13,800 years. That's a pretty old date for humans in North America. Now, we haven't gotten humans here yet. This ground sloth, it weighed uh, three tons, 6,000 pounds, <laughs> went extinct 12,000 years ago. Just astonishing animals, a land of monsters, just a land of monsters. So now people start to wonder, what, why do these fruits exist that no animal can eat? Can you imagine an animal eating an avocado? It's got a pit, you know, that's three, two and a half inches wide. It's not a problem for a ground sloth. The ground sloths are it evolved with ground sloths. Ground sloths are extinct. Now we have to eat the avocados. American lion, this lion, that also part of this menagerie that went extinct 10 to 12,000 years ago, weighed up to a thousand pounds. An African lion weighs 500 pounds. This was twice the size of an African lion, a land of monsters. I meant to point out when I showed that ice, ice in North America, there was no ice in Alaska during the last ice age, in part of Alaska. And it was, there was a grassland steppe and they called it the mammoth steppe. There were elephants. It was covered with elephants and bison and horses in Northern, in, in Alaska. Mm. Western Alaska. And this mammoth steppe was the dominant habitat in the Northern Hemisphere during the last ice age. It stretched all the way from Alaska through Siberia to Spain. And it was full of animals. It was, they say it was as productive as the African savanna today. Well, we're, just, we're mostly astonishing ourselves and talking about change. It's inevitable. Horses evolved in North America. They went extinct. 10,000 years ago, and I came back with Christopher Columbus in 90, 1493, second trip. There were, so horses definitely evolved in North America. Humans, humans, so this is out of Africa. 
humans evolved in Africa. There's pretty much no question about it. They first came out of Africa roughly 60,000 years ago. So thinking about the, our drama right now with the questions about race, all humans are Africans. I mean, it's an interesting thing to think about. Humans were in Africa far longer than they were anywhere else. They're, we're all Africans. So why fight? <laughs> or you know, why pass judgment? So this is a graphic, and these are rough. They're, the years are argued somewhat, but they're roughly correct. Out of Africa, 60, it says, well, <clears throat> number two there says 50,000 to 70,000 years ago. So I have an average of 60,000. Into Australia about 50,000 years ago, they had to get into boats. The ocean wasn't as wide because it was lower. The uh, ocean level was lower, but it was still 60 miles. So 60,000 years ago, they were able to 50,000 build boats and get to Australia and then across up in the upper left, the Bering Land Bridge. The Bering Land Bridge wasn't a bridge. It was 800 miles wide when humans walked across it from Siberia to Alaska. And we don't know quite when that was, about 20,000 years ago. Did humans cause those extinction of those 75 mammals? Probably, the answer is probably yes. The upper graph is Africa. Uh, the far right, excuse me, far left is 100,000 years ago. And then, I forget exactly, log time. But it's 100,000 years ago and then into the more, uh, into the present. So in Africa, where animals evolved with Homo sapiens, there were very few extinctions. Uh, the percent for survival, uh, it shows on the left, 100% survival, looks like 80% of the large mammals in Africa survived the evolution of Homo sapiens. In Australia, once humans, Homo sapiens arrived, almost all large mammals went extinct. North America, almost all went extinct. Madagascar happened more recently because it's an island and they only got there a thousand years ago, now going extinct. Did humans cause those extinctions? Probably so. This is more evidence. This is the Wenatchee Clovis cache found in Wenatchee in 1988 with these Clovis spear points. Why would you create a spear point that large unless you were gonna stick it into a woolly mammoth? They were definitely eating those large mammals. These are accepted dates. So this is a big story. When did humans first get to North America? You know, people get really worked up over this and fight over it. And, and it's interesting to remember, it doesn't actually matter when they got here. They weren't here and then they got here. That's the main point. Uh, but so there are these different, I think I circled one or two. There's Manus. We talked about Manus. That's pretty old, 13,800 years ago in Washington state, a mastodon was dug up by that guy's backhoe. And there's this one down in South America, Toca de Tira Pierre. It's fun to read about, 22,000 years. So my next shows a little list here, timeline. So I sort of have, the first entry is out of Africa. The second one includes what I, that one in South America, which I said back here was 22,000 years. I'm incorporating it because some of the claims for that area go up 48,000 years ago and it's disputed. So I put disputed, but there are some ancient human remains in Brazil. So you can read about it. And then you go down, uh, more accepted is this blue, bluefish caves in the Yukon. Well, that's in North America. Humans were in North America 24,000 years ago, but they couldn't get past the ice. They couldn't get past the ice until the ice melted. So then the Missoula floods. So then they start showing up in North America and South America, South Carolina, surprisingly. Monte Verde in Chile is now accepted at almost 15,000 years ago. That is a long way from Alaska. You know, this is a big story. We don't have time to go into it. The thing is, there were no humans. They made their way to North America and they colonized both continents fairly rapidly. And actually, this is close to the end. And this uh, Native American man is saying, I remember all this when all this was undeveloped land. Well, hopefully you think it's funny, it's a joke. Uh, and the rest, as they say, is history. It's what we see out our windows. I wanted to close with this because we, we have talked about so much destructive uh, drama. Uh, the volcanoes destroy everything in their path. The floods, the ice ages crushed everything. There would have been no life in the meadow. 
just just 15,000 years ago. There would not a mile of ice. There would have been nothing. That's a this is a picture of Reed Blackburn's Volvo. He was 10 miles away from the peak of the mountain when it went off in 1980, and he was killed in his car. He was filming it. And he's covered. His car is covered with ash. That's how destructive this is. But what happens after these destructive natural events? This is a picture taken at Mount St. Helens a month after the explosion. Flowers started to bloom. And what's it look like there now, 30 years later? It's, a, it's just completely recolonized by life except for the crater itself. So life is in a, a dynamic, integral relationship with the drama of the earth. And we are a part of that. And time is over at passing events. And we get to flit along in the stream. For a period of time. That's the end of that story. Can you want to unmute people?